I think it was eight or nine years ago, I was trying to think, Bishop, when we met. I, we were speaking together, I believe, at a conference in California. I think it's the first time you and I met. And we were both serving large churches in the jurisdiction, and it was I think it was a regional gathering, and we met, and we kind of became friends in the beginning, Facebook friends, and we've texted and emailed and, and stayed together. And I remember before your election, um, I'm probably not the only one who did this, but I remember texting and calling and saying, I think we need you as a bishop. And somehow, even in the midst of who we are as a church, you said, I'm willing. I can't thank you enough. For the sacrifice that you have made to help us become who we should have been. Let's take a minute and pray before Bishop Karen comes in and gives us a word. God, the words thank you don't seem adequate, but we thank you for your servant, Bishop Alavito. We thank you for her words, for her passion, for her hunger, for others to know the love of Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifices she's made to be our bishop. God, use her even tonight, even tonight, the third time she's speaking today, even tonight, use her to speak to us and help us become the church you need us to be. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. Amen. Bishop, would you come? It is really not fair to make the preacher cry before she preaches. Thank you. Oh, I uh, just want to say thank you, Dwayne. I love getting texts at weird hours. <laughs> saying, just praying for you. Yeah. And I'm praying for you. Thank you. And thank you, church. Thanks for inviting me here. Pray with me. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, be led by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Amen. I, I actually need a tissue. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Can you turn this off just a minute? You know, I get, I get dinged on Twitter a lot because I use the message. Good to see that I'm not alone in, in using it. I do. I, I love it because when I've used it in the past, people were like, why are you using that? Why are you using that? And I said, well, listen to it. And I... We used one of Paul's epistles, and, and I heard a gasp from the congregation. And I nudged, and I said, that's why I use it. Because it makes people hear anew. So I want you to hear Amos. Oh, that prophet. Seek good and not evil. And live. You talk about God, the God of the angel armies being your best friend, well, live like it. And maybe it'll, it'll happen. Hate evil, love good, then work it out in the public square. And then it goes on lower in the, in the chapter. Mm. I can't stand your religious meetings. I am fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion. Okay, a little transference going on right now. 
I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I am sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice. Oceans of it. I want fairness. Rivers of it. That's what I want. That is all I want. Amen. So before I moved to the Mountain Sky area, I lived in the only necropolis in North America, Colma, California. With 17 cemeteries, the living in Colma was never very far from the dead. <laughs> and the living residents are continually reminded of this. In fact, when you move into the town, the town gives you a bumper sticker. It's great to be alive in Colma. <laughs> When you live in Colma, you collect a lot of stories about death. I'd like to share with you one today about two men who loved each other dearly. One had a terminal illness and died while the other was out of town. When the man heard that his friend had died, he wept. And all who saw him weeping said, look at the depth of his grief, how much he loved him. And the man made himself back to the town where his friend had lived and died and upon arriving asked to be let into the dead man's crypt. A sister of the dead man told him, oh Jesus, he's been dead for four days and not embalmed. If you open that tomb, there will be a terrible stink. Jesus though cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped up with bandages and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, actually, no, it's not to him, sorry. Jesus said to them, to them, unbind him and let him go. We have a great deal to learn from this story because too many of us, while we are living, are forced into tombs incest survivors, those who have been battered, addicts, the unemployed or underemployed, those with opinions and commitments contrary to the status quo, lesbians, gay men, bisexual, transgender, and queer persons, for all people who must keep a part of their lives hidden, tombs are a place of death that sucks the life breath out of them. Closets are tombs. And let's remember that tombs are meant for the dead and not the living. You know, the forces of death are all around us, unmistakable in their brazenness. What did we learn during COVID? Healthcare continues to be a privilege of the rich rather than a right for all people in our country. The result is that too many can't afford health care or go bankrupt when facing life-threatening illnesses. The sin of racism against people of color, against immigrants fleeing violence for sanctuary within our borders has placed too many men, women, and children in tombs of hopelessness and violence. Our nation has been enforcing an unofficial law against walking while black carrying with it a punishment of death that has left too many black and brown mothers and fathers weeping over the graves of their children. In spite of scientific evidence and calls from the world community, environmental issues are still being backburnered so as not to hinder big business profit entombing all living things in toxic crypts of global warming and pollution. Women's rights are under assault. 
voting rights are being eroded, books are being banned as the good news of the gospel is being replaced by the unholy epistle of Tucker Carlson. And what's happening? Hearts and minds are being locked in crypts of complacency. Heterosexism and homophobia fuel implied and very real threats against queer people entombing us in tombs of lies and silence and half-lived lives. You know, there's, I keep coming back to the story of, of one of my parishioners, and I, I don't know why, but this is the third time I've told his story in just the last month, so something i got to deal with his story, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. When I arrived at Glide in 2008, the very first person I met was Tyler. We went out for coffee, and he shared about growing up in a church that he loved. A church which, when they became aware of his sexuality, condemned him and ostracized him. The brokenness he experienced by a community that was supposed to be agents of God's love and grace devastated him. And he sunk into a life of addictions, in part because while he knew he loved God, because of what he had been taught, he didn't believe that God loved him. In time, he found a church that welcomed him, all of who he was with open arms. Clean and sober, he became a lawyer. He would regularly earn gobs of money, like lawyers do, I guess. <laughs> and then he would take six months off, and he'd go to third world countries where he would live out his passion of teaching literacy to children. As he sat across from me, he told me a story that was so amazing, I just hear it like it was yesterday. He had worked for a couple of months in Tanzania. And before he left to come home, he wanted to fulfill a lifelong dream and see chimpanzees in the wild. So he hired a guide, a guide who said, oh, I know where they are. And they macheted their way through the wild. After several hours of doing this macheteing, when the bushes were parted, no chimps. <laughs> the guy said, oh, no, 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 don't worry. Actually, there's another place I know where they are at this hour, but it, it's just through the brush and over the next mountain. Now, Tyler had come too far to turn back, so they macheted their way through the brush, and when they got to the mountain, they saw a waterfall and at its base. Sure enough, there were chimpanzees. But as he looked, he was like, what, what am I seeing? There's, there's a woman watching the chimps. A white woman. A white woman with long gray hair, Jane Goodall. He raced down the mountain and stood before her, struggling to get his breath back in. And he introduced himself, and she looked at him in the eye and said, I wish I could imitate her voice. Why are you here? Well, he told her he was from the States, and he was there to teach people reading to children, and she sat silently, and then said again, why are you here? Well, he thought maybe he was speaking too fast because he was out of breath, and so he, he just kind of slowed himself down a little and said what he said before, and she again looked at him and asked one more time, why are you here? At that point, when he was telling me the story, he looked me in the eye and he said, I've been trying to figure out the answer to that question ever since. Tyler made several trips to third world countries and then 
I performed his funeral. The early rejection he had received from his church community, the messages that he was sinful, an abomination, incompatible with the church's teaching, had left a wound that never healed. And he felt unworthy of this gift of life. And he committed suicide. Goodall's question to Tyler is one I keep revisiting over and over again. Why am I here? Why am I here? Am I extending the love and grace of God to every person who enters the doors of the church? Or am I making some feel unworthy of it? Now, I know there's this thing that happened. But you know, the message we in the United Methodist Church have been giving LGBTQ members and their families are, why are you here? And it's not meant in that thoughtful, soulful way that Jane Goodall offered to Tyler. Because, you see, the message we've been giving to LGBTQ persons is, you're not welcomed. You're not wanted here. When an LGBTQ person walks in the door of a United Methodist Church, they have more to worry about than, am I going to sit in someone's pew? They have to wonder if they can be themselves here and still be welcomed. And you know, when they're not welcomed, a part of them dies. When a clergy person doesn't have the moral courage, and yes, it's moral courage, to perform the wedding of a same-sex couple who has served their church faithfully, that couple experiences a death. When a baby is refused baptism because he has two moms, that family experiences a death. There are souls rotting in our pews and pulpits. There is a stench when lives are forced into closet tombs. But there's one thing I know. There is one thing I know. The God who made us has more in mind for us than these closet tombs of death. The God who made us desires that we live free and unfettered lives. The God who made us calls us beloved and honors us with dignity. The God who made us and loves us summons us to come out. Come out of the darkness and death. Come out of the tomb of despair and injustice and embrace life in all its fullness. Brian, before you preach, things happen here that don't usually. Excuse me. Here is where we who follow Jesus find hope. Death is never the final answer. Right? Amen. Amen. Try as others might to keep us in tombs, we are always and forever assured of resurrection's power to break open our closets of death. Oppression and injustice fall in the face of love's redeeming work found in resurrection. Jesus stands at our closet tombs and calls us to come out. But you know what? He doesn't stop there. You'll recall that when Lazarus arose from his tomb, Jesus turns to the community. And what does he tell them? And we were talking about this earlier today. He turns to the community and says, unbind him and let him go. Lazarus can be released from death's chains only if those around him free him from his bonds. And the same is true with us. Rob Rains reminds us that there is a ministry of unbinding one another, of letting people go. This is the Moses ministry imperative for individuals and families and institutions and churches and systems and nations. Let my people go. 
dismantle the chains of oppression, disassemble economic and political arrangements that make and keep people on the outside in order to make, for us to make a healthy reassembling of these systems. So it's time for us. It's time for us to heed the call of the prophet Mo Amos. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. Hate evil. Love good. And then work it out in the public square. The Holy Spirit can't be trapped by bigotry and prejudice. It has been moving through our country as, as more and more Americans realize that, you know what, black lives matter, that perhaps there is more to diversity to the human species than our mind has been able to comprehend until now. And together, they've been participating in people's release from closets to liberations, just as Jesus called upon the community to unbind Lazarus. So, as the global Methodist church births itself as a new denomination, I wasn't going to say this, but I will. I'm going to sound kind of be honest. I don't know how you can build a church based on who you're living, leaving out. I, I just don't think that's church. But as that happens, it's time for the United Methodist Church, which was once called the most Americanized of denominations, which that's a whole thing to unpack, to have a come to Jesus moment. Will we ignore the way the Holy Spirit is working in the public square and in people's lives? Or will we ignore that? Or will we allow our denomination's social witness to be informed by that? The denomination has increasingly stood outside the public square, unwilling to participate in life-giving conversations with persons who have been pushed to society's margins. We have been too content with keeping folks in our church in closets, clutching our prejudices and biases like our pearls, and twisting a theology of grace into something unrecognizable that we've used to justify our rejection of God's children rather than embrace them as our kin. As a result, we have fostered injustice in our church and beyond it. We have removed ourselves from the public square. As a result, the and we talked about this to earlier today, the church is becoming increasingly irrelevant to the generations that are coming after us. We must, we must stand firmly in the public square and seek justice, yeah. oceans of it, yeah. and fairness, rivers of it, making connections between our own liberation and the liberation of others. We all must work together to challenge and confront anything that creates tombs and death and stands in the way of justice and fairness. Anything that seeks to create second-class citizenship, anything that seeks to deny the dignity and self-worth of any of God's beloved children. Make no mistake, we must put the same energy we put in our own liberation, we have to put that same energy into the liberation of others. Because we are all interconnected, whether racism or sexism or heterosexism or ableism or ageism or classism, whatever ism shackles the souls of our siblings must be broken. We must take a stand against the evils of oppression in whatever forms they manifest themselves. 
You and I are called to make crossroads of hope at the intersections of oppression so that love will overcome hate and life will outlast death. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. This is what it means to co-create with God, beloved community. So my siblings, it's time for we who follow Jesus to commit ourselves to this ministry of unbinding. Now, Mary warns us as Mary warned Jesus. There'll be a stink when we open tombs. And don't we know it to be true? So let's raise a stink to high heaven against injustice so those once dead can rise to life. Let's make a, a consecrated stink so that our churches can stop creating closets. Let's raise a holy stink against oppression so that these tired old bones of the church can live again. And you know what? Let's create a sacred stink so that every child of God, no matter the color of their skin or their ability or their sexual orientation or gender identity, their immigration status, will know that they are beloved. Is there anything more we are called to do than that? To let them know they are worthy of God's love. May, may we remember that we are here for the sole purpose of spreading the love and light of God. So let us leave our closets of death. May we seize the life that God intended, one that affirms our lives, confirms our love, blesses our relationships, and consecrates us to the holy task of unbinding one another from all that enslaves them, so that we may find, we may find, and every one of us will find, and all those who don't yet know it yet, that they are wrapped in the loving arms of God and community. Amen.